The following program is classified M and is suitable for persons age 15 years and over. It contains adult themes. Hello, I'm Steve Liebman. The story you're about to see involves Australia's biggest crime investigation and longest running manhunt. It details the long and difficult search for a serial killer. A search that began in January 1996, when the first of three young women disappeared here at Claremont in Perth. Now, as part of a new police appeal for public assistance, we'll be revealing important information about the case, information which has never been made public. And with me is Detective Sergeant Jim Stanbury from the Special Crime Squad, who's going to help us review the facts of this case. And Jim, this is where it all began. That's right, this is Claremont. This is where our three victims went missing from in 1996 and 1997. Sarah was the first. Sarah Spears disappeared in 1996. Jane Rimmer, she went also uh, in 1996. And Kira Glennon, she went missing in 1997. So tell me a little bit about Claremont. Well, Claremont is really the hub of the western suburbs here in Perth, and I'd equate the western suburbs to perhaps the eastern suburbs of Sydney. It's quite a ritzy, affluent area, and certainly Claremont is the hub of, of the western suburbs. We've got cafes and restaurants and uh, a fair bit of nightlife here. Just behind us is a, a licensed establishment and there's a nightclub also in the area. So a lot of people come to Claremont and congregate. And I imagine Claremont today, as was probably the case those 12 years ago on a Thursday, Friday or Saturday night, was a pretty buzzy place to be. Oh, definitely. There was plenty of people around. It was a, a hive of activity. And a lot of people come to this area to go to the pubs and clubs. And uh, yeah, there's always heaps of people walking around, driving around. Jim, it's been a long investigation, probably the longest murder investigation in Australian history. That's correct. It's been a long and complex investigation. Uh, we've interviewed thousands of people. We've taken thousands of statements. We've uh, gathered uh, over 100,000 items of evidence. We've employed experts from all around the world, from the USA, from the UK, and around Australia to uh, help us try and solve these crimes. Thanks, Jim. Now, let's go back to the beginning of this mammoth investigation, now known Australia-wide as the Claremont Murders. Sarah Spears is the daughter of Western Australian shearing contractor Don Spears and his wife Carol. With her older sister Amanda, Sarah grew up in the country and attended boarding school in Perth. Uh, they're both very bright girls, um, very, both of them very compassionate. Sarah, they're both different natured, but they got on like a house on fire, they're just great buddies. I, to my knowledge, they've never ever had an argument in their life. They're always there for one another. Sarah is intensely family-minded. She seems constantly to go out of her way to make sure her sister and parents are comfortable and happy. Um, she had a way about her that you don't come, come across too often in people. She used to light me up. The minute I saw her, she just lit me up. Her eyes had, were bright and she was always stumbling forward to greet you, um, very affectionate with all of us, with her mother and her sister, and I would say particularly myself. She was, she was really um, yeah, always there for, for, for all of us. Uh, I think that Sarah was a typical, beautiful, smart 18-year-old who was just on the cusp of starting this fantastic adult life. The sisters share a flat in South Perth and their parents often come down from their home in the country to join them at weekends. In mid-January 1996, 
the family is together at the Perth flat, planning Amanda's 21st birthday party. I, I, I wasn't looking forward to going back to the country, so I actually got out of the car after being ready to drive away about four times and give them another hug, and they were on the, on the apron of the driveway waving goodbye as we drove down the road, and I was sort of looking back at them through the rear view mirror and just thinking, gee, I hope you're safe until I see you again next time. And little did I know that I'd never ever see Sarah again. On Friday, the 26th of January, 1996, the Australia Day holiday, Sarah and some friends are planning a picnic dinner at an open air concert in Kings Park. As evening falls, they're joined by Amanda, who then drives them to the Ocean Beach Hotel in the upmarket suburb of Cottesloe. They left um, that hotel at about midnight. Yes, he'll be there. Well, I don't know if he's there yet. They were collected by Sarah's older sister, Amanda, that had been pre-arranged, and Amanda drove them into Claremont. It was their intention to go to Club Bay View, which is a popular night spot, and kick on there at the nightclub. She was at the OBH Friday night, and I went there. I called in to see her and Emma and to tell them that I'd drop them at club if they wanted to go. And then I went to a friend's, then I came back and got them, and she was happy, um, gave me a hug, kiss, goodbye, thanks for dropping us off. It's the last time I saw her. Well, you wouldn't want to go out with a girl like that anyway, what a freak. Amanda was um, working, uh, she was going to university and doing several part-time jobs, which was fairly taxing on her. Normally she would have gone and picked Sarah up, but she asked Sarah to catch a taxi that night because um, she was in need of a bit of rest. It's nearly 2 a.m. when Sarah tells her friends that she's going to call it a night. How's your sister? Amanda, yeah, she's good. She's good. I'm just going home to her now, so yeah. Anyway, I'm going to go. Take care. How are you getting home? I'm just catching a taxi down the end of the road. I'll be careful, by the way. All right, thanks. Bye. Yeah, good night. See you soon. On her way out, she chats with a security guard at the door and then walks down to a phone box on the corner of Stirling Road and Stirling Highway. Precisely six minutes past two, she calls Swan Taxis. Hi, can I get a taxi to pick me up, please, at the corner of Stirling Highway and Stirling Road? But instead of saying she's going to South Perth, where she lives, she tells the operator she wants to go to the suburb of Mosman Park. But we think that she was intending to catch a cab down to a friend's house in Mosman Park. She'd been there earlier on in the day and it had been suggested to her that if she needed a place to crash for the night that she could catch a cab to their place. It would have been much cheaper doing that than catching a cab to South Perth. Sarah crosses Stirling Road and waits on the opposite side near the intersection of Stirling Highway. About this time, three young men in a car drive past Sarah and reach the intersection, where they stop for a red light. Oh, look at her, mate. She's pretty cute. Yeah, mate, she's a great sort. You think she'd be all right there by herself? Yeah, mate, she'd be fine. Oh, I wonder what she's doing there all by herself. Same as us, mate. Probably finish up clubbing on the way home. One of the men sees another car coming down Stirling Road approaching Sarah and he's still looking back at her as the light turns green and they turn onto the highway. As they drive away, he notices that the car does not come on through the intersection behind them. I think we should go back and check on her? He actually said to the other occupants of the car that perhaps they should go back and check on that girl, uh, which we are confident was Sarah. You know, it was late at night, she's good looking, and she was there by herself, and, you know, the car hadn't come into view. 
For a moment, the men consider turning back, but then decide it's unlikely a girl would have any trouble in the Claremont area, and they drive away. At nine minutes past two, Sarah's taxi arrives. But Sarah is gone. The taxi was travelling on Stirling Highway and it stopped at the traffic lights at Stirling Road. The taxi driver uh, looked up the road towards the phone box. I mean, the phone box was very, very nearby. And he didn't see Sarah at the phone box. He didn't see anyone at all in the vicinity. Sarah had vanished. Um, I became most concerned on Monday morning when I rang, she starts work at eight and I rang at quarter past eight just to catch up with her because I hadn't seen her all weekend. And as soon as I found out she wasn't there, I rang all of her friends and no one had seen her since Friday night. And then I came home here because I had stayed at a friend's, came home here and we rang the police from here at about quarter to nine. Amanda did ring us and say that Sarah hadn't been in touch with her on the Sunday and she had a tone about her of concern. Think of every scenario as to what might have caused Sarah not to be in touch with us. Maybe she'd been assaulted. Uh, maybe she'd gone away where there was no phone that she could ring us and, and couldn't get back. Or um, I even drove down to Manger to check her property out down there to make sure that she wasn't down there. Mm. Just down and back straight away. Um, every scenario I was going through in my head, it was becoming quite a nightmare. But really, due to the circumstances, it was identified very early on that this was probably more than just a missing persons case. And within 48 hours, the Major Crime Squad had taken over the investigation. Pictures of Sarah are circulated along with descriptions of her beige Portman shorts and light-coloured T-shirt, and particularly her distinctive shoes. They were beige suede shoes and had quite a distinctive chunky heel and a pattern cut out of the top of the shoe. Sarah Spears disappeared after leaving a nightclub. 35,000 posters are distributed around Perth. Sarah's friends and family and other volunteers walk around the streets at night asking if anyone has seen her. I was always hopeful that she would just walk in the door. I mean, I spent, spent my afternoon sitting in the front lounge waiting for her to walk through the door. Police appeal for everyone in the Claremont area on that night to come forward. Hundreds respond. Sarah's family is also swamped with phone calls at all hours. Many claim to be psychics, reporting they've had dreams and visions. I had one bowl into our house and just charge upstairs and you know, pretend she was dry reaching and you know, said how ghastly it was in front of us. And then she came downstairs and said, oh, your Sarah's been, had her head smashed in with a rock and gave me a location where she was. And, in the meantime, she's taking phone calls from other people and quoting prices for sessions. And So every time another one of these nutters wrote and said, I've seen it in my dreams that Sarah's body will be down at Salter's Point, you knew that they, they kind of thought it was, it was nutty, but they had to chase every rabbit down every hole. And the anguish on Carol Spears' face when she was hoping against hope that her daughter would walk in the door. And over time, the realisation that she never would, it's just heartbreaking. I thought I was grasping at straws, I was grasping at anything, and you know, one had me out in swampland, you know, middle of the night, midnight, slushing around swampland looking for Sarah. And you know, um, after a while, I did learn um, to steer clear of clairvoyance because. Um, they gave me nothing but a lot of grief. What, what can you tell us about you doing? What kind of Exhausted by the psychics, Don and Carol can do nothing more. Sarah's a very caring person. 
So, police believe there may still be someone who can supply information about Sarah's disappearance. Jim, what are you looking for? Well, Steve, that second vehicle that drove down Stirling Road has never been identified. Nobody's ever come forward. What I want is the occupants of that vehicle to come forward and identify themselves. Police believe there may still be someone who can supply information about Sarah's disappearance. And the hunt for Sarah becomes a much wider crime investigation when just five months after she disappeared, a second young woman goes missing from Claremont. Welcome back to this special edition of Crime Investigation Australia. Detectives followed every possible lead that might help solve the mystery of Sarah Spears' disappearance. And then after five months, in June 1996, another woman went missing here in Claremont. And Jim, there were similarities, weren't there? Yes, there was. I mean, both the victims were attractive young women. They had been out socialising with their friends in the Claremont area. It was really at the end of their night out and, and they were really trying to get home. And they were walking alone. This woman's name was Jane Rimmer. The Perth suburb of Shenton Park is 10 minutes drive from Claremont. It's here that Trevor and Jenny Rimmer set up their family home in the early 1960s. The youngest daughter, Jane, is born in 1973. Jane is a quiet child, but grows into a fun-loving, caring young woman whose ambition is to work with children. She gets her own flat and a job with a child care centre. She, she's a ni nice, friendly girl. She was soft, ni nice girl. She, um, she worked with the children. Um, she was always very smiley. I thought she was gorgeous. And um, her personality matched her face. You know, she was just, you could see her goodness just shining out of her, really. She was just a good person. And uh, caring. Um, and she was young. And, you know, we were all rat baggy when we were young, so <laughs> she could be a rat bag. But she was still responsible, you know, and definitely with the children, like she was really, really good with them. On Saturday, the 8th of June, 1996, 23-year-old Jane links up with Linda Donovan and other friends at the Ocean Beach Hotel at Cottesloe. It's the same hotel that Sarah Spears had been to early on the night she disappeared. So she sat down with us and we sort of ate our dinner and had a few drinks there and then we left and went to the Continental. The Continental Hotel is another of Claremont's popular night spots and is packed with a typical young Saturday night crowd. And we sort of went to the upstairs area, which is where you did all your dancing. And we were just all dancing and carrying on like you do when you're 20-odd. <laughs> Around 11.30pm, the group leaves the hotel and walks to the nearby Club Bayview. Jane didn't want to go, she hated the place. But because we were all going, she decided to come along. Um, so we went there, and there was a line to get in, so we decided that we wouldn't go. And by that stage, a couple of us were feeling a little tired, so we decided we'd go home. And um, we were walking back along, and Jane was kind of lagging behind. And I knew that she didn't want to go home, she wasn't ready to go home yet, but the rest of us sort of were. Um, okay, okay we'll just we'll grab a taxi and we'll pick her up on the way around. Yeah, yeah. Do that. Um. Oh, look, there she is. Jane, come on, we're going back to Kate's house for some drinks. That's all right, I'm going to hang out here a bit longer. But you guys have a good night. All right, well, call me tomorrow. Okay. But I think she was just lonely. She just wanted someone special. 
She probably wanted to meet someone that night because that's what you do when you go out, you want to meet someone. As her friends drive away in their taxi, Jane stays behind, alone. The following day, Jane fails to arrive for the usual Sunday lunch with her parents, and they're immediately worried. Trevor and Jenny check her flat and find she has not been home and call the police. With the obvious similarities to Sarah's disappearance, the police commanders set up a special task force to combine the two searches. It's given the title, Macro. It was recognised by the police that there was obvious links between the two disappearances. Both victims were Caucasian, both were similar in appearance, both were in a similar age group, both had gone missing from the same area, both had gone missing between the hours of midnight and 2am, and there was real concerns that there was one person out there preying on young women in the community. It sounded, uh, it sounded too spooky for there not to be some sort of connection. The Rimmer family and friends begin distributing pictures of Jane to try to jog the memory of anyone who might have seen her. They had loads of flyers made up and we just posted them around and stuck them on the windows of our cars and wherever we stopped we would um, so if we stopped in a service station, we would ask if we could put one up in the window. And I believe um, the Sunday Times or the West Australian came on board and actually distributed them with their papers. So absolutely everyone who bought a paper ended up with one of those flyers. On Saturday, the 3rd of August, 1996, 55 days after Jane was reported missing, a family is driving down a road in Wellard, about 40 kilometres south of Perth, when they decide to stop to pick wildflowers. The family's mother, Tammy Van Royt, is picking some wild lilies when she suddenly sees a body in the grass at her feet. And the, the husband, he could see it must have been the fear in my face. He came running and I said, she's in there. And he said, who's in there? And I said, she's in there. And he went in there and quickly checked and said, right, get in the car and tried grabbing me in. And I said, no, I'm not leaving. I said, get the kids. I was quite angry. I was, you know, really angry. She told us later that she couldn't leave Jane there alone by herself. When that happened, the, it was like you didn't know what to do. We have to go over and say, are you OK? Um, can I help you? What, you know, what can you do? It's a very, very nasty time. I guess we're thankful for the 23 years that we did have. Whoever did it can't take that away. With the discovery of Jane Rimmer's body, detectives begin a national manhunt for her killer. And later in the program, we'll reveal some vital new information. But just nine months after Jane was abducted, came more shattering news. Yet another young woman had disappeared from Claremont. In 1996, Sarah Spears and Jane Rimmer disappear from here in the Perth suburb of Claremont. Jane's body was later found 40 kilometres south of here by the side of the road. But the disappearance and murder would not be the end of the tragedy. In March 1997, just nine months later, 27-year-old lawyer Kira Glennon goes out for drinks with her workmates and never returns. Kira is a bright law student. She speaks Japanese fluently, and after an extended holiday backpacking around the world, she's now back in Perth, completing her studies and working in a legal office. She has a feisty, spirited personality, 
and a sense of fun that appeals to everyone who meets her. It's Friday evening, March 14th, 1997. Kira has had after-work drinks at her office before going on with a few colleagues to the Continental Hotel in Claremont at 11 p.m. I think so, yeah, you can get bar snacks, yeah. It's a few days before St. Patrick's Day, so the hotel is crowded and she stays for only 20 minutes. She went off and the group saw her speaking to other people in the hotel and then she came up to him and said she was going. She grabbed a jacket that she had left with one of, the, one of her colleagues and she walked out. A group of men gathered at a nearby bus stop watch Kira as she walks south down Stirling Highway towards her home in Mosman Park. As she was walking down the road, one of these men actually called out to her. He thought that she was hitchhiking. Hey, hey, you're crazy for hitchhiking. I'll be fine, thanks. I said something to him you can't really remember and she sort of waved him off and she kept on walking. Now the other, two, the other two men that were there, they didn't think that she was hitchhiking, but she was certainly walking down the path towards her home. A few minutes later, one of these three men looked down the road and saw Kira talking to the occupants of a vehicle that had stopped. The only certainty is the vehicle was light coloured, but the make and model of the car can't be confirmed from the witness accounts. Ooh, I'd say. You work tomorrow? Yeah, man, 8 o'clock I'll start. I really need to get onto that taxi, yo, because I'm done for. Mm -hmm. Wait, she, yeah, she's gone, man. She's gone. There are other possible sightings of Kira further along Stirling Highway, so it can't be confirmed if she did or did not get into this vehicle. On Saturday morning, Kira's mother finds that she has not returned home. A call to one of her friends reveals that Kira was last seen leaving the hotel in Claremont by herself. The news that a third woman is missing from Claremont angers and frustrates the macro investigators and spreads alarm throughout Perth. Radio stations begin to broadcast safety messages to warn young women of the danger. For instance, keep a mobile phone phone with you. you know, if you're going, if you're, keep, keep to lighted areas, and all sorts of safety messages that we were hoping would remove the potential prey of the offender from his view. The West Australian government posts a reward of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, the largest ever offered in the state. Kira's shattered father, Dennis, makes a public appeal for help. Only now do I even begin to understand uh, the, the terrible trauma that the parents of Jane and Sarah went through. Kira may be there. And the look of horror, I'll never forget that press conference when you know this strong, proud man with tears running down his face and feeling sort of a bit embarrassed by the fact that he couldn't keep it all together and having to make an appeal to find his daughter. Um, you know, just, you know, truly, truly heartbreaking. Life must go on. That's what we intend to do. Kira may be there. The Glennons are inundated with phone calls from strangers. They include the usual clairvoyance, tormenting them with the standard cryptic clues and useless information. Uh, thank you, Commander Ibbotson. Um, Dennis Glennon also starts a fund called the Secure Community Foundation, the SCF, which raises hundreds of thousands of dollars for extra resources for the investigation. On April 3rd, 1997, 19 days after Kira disappeared, a 24-year-old labourer is bushwalking at Eglinton on Perth's northern outskirts. 
Near a sandy track, he comes across a body and runs to tell his boss. Jason just came, was well actually run, run down the road, came straight into my office um, and he was, uh, I could say, pretty well white as a ghost. Um, said he had found someone, uh, didn't really know who it was, but someone that looked like a female. He was distraught, we had to put him on a chair, sit him down, get some water, um, because he was in a pretty bad way. Uh, I would say there was some shock. Police now confirm publicly that they're hunting a serial killer. Tony, what have, what have you got for us? What's the latest? A, a preliminary investigation the scene reveals a body to be that of a female that appears to be that of Kira Glennon. There's a bitumen road to about 50 metres to our right and just up on the top of the hill behind us is a little uh, access dirt track. We think that probably the killer drove into there to get off the main road and from there he's carried Kira's body down to this location. An Australian criminal profiler, Claude Minasini, and a visiting American FBI profiler, Captain David Caldwell, construct a character outline of the murderer. Many serial killers have been shown to be sadistic psychopaths who take pleasure from dominating their victims. They're known to practice torture, rape and mutilation. While the Claremont killer may not fit this type of distinctive personality, all the character clues are reviewed by various experts and the profile is continually updated throughout the investigation. As well as profiling, clues to the killer's personality and to his relationship with his victims can also be found in the way in which the bodies were abandoned and the type of wounds they carry. With the Claremont murders, the police will not reveal the cause of death of each of the women and the exact injuries to their bodies. These are facts known only to the killer and those who found and examined the bodies. Keeping these secrets might help police to track down the culprit and later prove his guilt in court. Other facts are also withheld from the public and information control becomes a hallmark of the case as Macro's leaders battle to limit inaccurate speculation that can confuse the investigation. First of all, it clouds the judgment and memories of witnesses who might have valid information to provide. But more importantly, it provides the offender with confidence. And when the offender has confidence, he's more likely to continue his offences. To prevent any leaks, there's an unprecedented level of secrecy within the police force itself. So they were not to talk to it. Even, even fellow officers who were not on the task force, they had to sign a conf confidentiality clause that they don't talk to anyone about the case. I mean, that's usually how you get information as a journalist, you know, from police sources. All that's revealed about the killer's profile is that he's organised and that both abductions were carefully planned and controlled. So this person clearly knew what they were doing and had planned it meticulously. And right down to what they were going to do, when the girls got in the car, how they, you know, how they restrained them, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. It would have to have been well planned for it to have been carried out so well. As to motive, um, other than the, um, the, the pleasures that some people of this type get from this type of offence, um, I couldn't, I'd be theorising to take it any further. Looks after his vehicle and would most probably uh, wash and polish the car after uh, the disappearance of the girls. A controlled man with a job who likes driving, say police. A person who's finding anxiety hard to hide. The person who's responsible for these incidents uh, would certainly be feeling stressed today. The public responded fantastically. They really got on board and, and did their utmost to help police try and catch the person or persons responsible for these murders. Um, at one point, there was so much information coming in, we could barely cope. In the month following the discovery of Kira's body, around 50,000 calls are made to Crime Stoppers. At one point, 
at a rate of 2,000 calls a day. New and sophisticated database technology is imported from the UK to help sort and coordinate the material and follow up every lead. What we want is whoever was in that vehicle that stopped and spoke to Kira on the side of Stirling Highway to come forward and speak to police. So, give me a sense, if you can, of what it must have been like, the atmosphere here in Claremont, but not just Claremont, throughout Perth, after Kira's death. I think it's fair to say that people were frightened. Nobody wanted to come down to Claremont anymore. I mean, at night, the streets were deserted down here. It was a terrible time for people who lived and worked in the Claremont area. Now, throughout the 12-year hunt for the Claremont serial killer, one piece of evidence has been deliberately withheld by the police. There were good reasons to keep it hidden for so long, and you'll hear about it in just a moment. Welcome back to this special program on the Claremont murders. The search for Sarah Spears and Jane Rimmer and Kira Glennon's killer remains one of the largest ongoing manhunts in Australian criminal history. And with me again is Detective Sergeant Jim Stanbury. Now, Jim, what we're about to see is security vision could be critical to the investigation that has never been seen by the general public before. When was it shot and where was it shot? It was shot on the night that Jane was abducted and murdered on the 8th of June 1996 and it's taken from outside the Continental Hotel in Claremont. Okay, now let's roll the vision. At that point that Jane and her friends leave the hotel, what happen what's happening You here? can see Jane and her friends come outside of the hotel now and they're just congregating around this pole uh, discussing about what they're going to do next. Somewhere through the night, I can't remember whose decision it was, we decided we were bored there so we would go to Club Bay View. So we went there and there was a line to get in, so we decided that we wouldn't go. And by that stage, a couple of us were feeling a little tired, so we decided we'd go home. And your inquiries indicate that the friends said to Jane, come with us, we're getting a cab. That's correct. And Jane, at the last minute, decided she didn't want to do that. And she said she was going to stay behind, stay down outside the Continental And Hotel. did she give any reason why she was staying behind? No, none whatsoever. Oh, no, it's OK. I'm going to hang out here a bit longer. But you guys have a good night. All right, well, call me tomorrow. All right, cool. Jane's at top of screen now, and she's quite focused on the Goojery Street end of, uh, of the area. Right. And she walks out there onto the street now. OK, on her own. She's by herself. Plenty of people on the street, plenty of people spilling out of the hotel. They haven't been able to help you. Correct. We've identified and interviewed all of these people that are out here on the street, and none of them have been able to provide us with any significant information. Now, we should keep pointing out that there are several security cameras that you've the vision from several cameras you've utilised here. So people should, should be aware that the angles are changing. Correct. Her demeanour appears to be different, doesn't it? I mean, she seems relaxed, cool, calm, friendly, looking. We will shortly see, come into shot, uh, a person of interest. You've called him the mystery, mystery man. the mystery man. That's correct. Because of all the people that were there, this is the one person you've yet to interview. That's correct. Who's yet to come forward. That's correct. There's the man. That's correct. She recognises him. Yes. As you can see, it looks like she's laughing or something along those lines. She is interacting with him. Whatever he's doing or saying, she is communicating with okay. him. Okay. And now we're looking 28 seconds later. Mystery man has, has left. Okay. Jane is still there at the curb, quite relaxed, looking around. All these people here you've spoken to haven't been able to help you as far as his identity is concerned? That's correct. Okay. Now, at this point, she looks at a watch. It appears that's, that's what she's doing, yes. Checks her watch. Again, she's still focused down Bayview Terrace. Okay. And our vision is about to change. There's been a 28-second jump. That scene there where we saw a look down at her watch is the last vision of Jane alive on the night in question. That's correct. 28 seconds later, she's vanished. That's correct. We don't know who Mystery Man is, 
where he went or where he is, no. and we don't know what happened to Jane. Correct. This inquiry's been going on for 12 years. Why have you only now decided to release this vision? Well, Steve, it's been no secret that we've had this video footage and we've shown it to over 700 people. We didn't want to release it in the early days of the inquiry because we didn't want to narrow the focus of the inquiry. We didn't want to bring everyone's attention onto this one person. There are many other facets to the inquiry and we wanted to cast the net quite wide and bring in all the information. You have to remember that Jane is still there for two and a half minutes after Mystery Man disappears from view. But it's an opportunity now for us to release it to the public. Conventional methods have not been able to identify this male. We release it to the public. We want him to come forward and identify himself. So, now that you've released the vision, you want either so-called Mystery Man to come forward and maybe eliminate himself from the investigation, Correct. or anybody who may know Mystery Man to come forward and I want them to get on the phone and contact Crime Stoppers. If you have any information that may help police identify this man, please call Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000. In an investigation that's lasted more than 12 years, detectives have been unable to charge anyone in connection with the murder of Jane Rimmer and Kira Glennon. Faced with constant demands for a result, the police have been subjected to almost continuous criticism throughout the life of the case. The macro investigation has also had years of intensive official scrutiny and has been reviewed no less than 11 times. Among the reviewers was one of Australia's most senior homicide detectives, Mike Hagan. The purpose of a review is to um, have an independent look at a major investigation and to, for someone to have a look at it that hasn't actually been involved in the original investigation, it brings a degree of independence to the investigation and credibility. We found after um, <clears throat> doing their review and having the opportunity to look at the whole process of the investigation, having a look at the structure of the task force, uh, the management of the task force, the investigative practices, we found that uh, it had been professionally conducted, that uh, the task force members and the command structure had used every available investigative method and um, they used everything the resources that were available to try and to get an outcome. The most recent and largest review was a massive reworking of all the evidence by veteran detective superintendent Paul Schramm, the man whose team solved Australia's worst serial killing case, the notorious Bodies in the Barrels at Snowtown. The Schramm review was the 11th review of the Macro Task Force. It was uh, an extraordinary review. It had national and international uh, a panel formed. Um, I have read the document and I'm still amazed today at the detail that, and the amount of uh, energy that was put into that review. Schramm's review highlighted the possibility that the killer may have had a house in the Claremont area, since the girls probably would have put up a fight and he'd have needed to control them quickly. Um, it's never too late to find uh, the aspects or the facts in issue of an investigation. And that's why it's important for police to keep persevering uh, with an investigation because ultimately they'll get to, the, to get to the truth of the matter. The environment we live in today is, is such that things change on the air, especially uh, uh, with forensic innovations and uh, investigative techniques that uh, are developed throughout the world. The world being one community like it is today, we, we are tapped in all over the world to any new uh, advances in those methods and we take full advantage of them. Unfortunately the outcome hasn't come yet, but I believe positively with further investigation that there will be, that this matter will finally be resolved. A new police unit is now in charge, a special squad within the major crime division and they're wiping all previous assumptions about the case.
You've been watching a special edition of Crime Investigation Australia coming to you from the Perth suburb of Claremont. And as you've just seen, detectives have released exclusive closed circuit television footage of Jane Rimmer and what are believed to be her last movements before she disappeared. With us tonight has been Detective Sergeant Jim Stanbury, head of the WA Special Crime Squad. And Jim, what are you hoping tonight's program will produce? Well, there's three things I want out of tonight's program. The first thing is I want to identify who the occupants were of that vehicle that was driving down Stirling Road towards Sarah Spears and there were, she fact, disappeared. There were, there were two vehicles. One continued on its way, but the occupants of that vehicle suddenly realised that the vehicle that was following was no longer there. That's right. You want the people that were in that second vehicle to come forward and identify themselves? Yes, I do. Okay, so that's the first point. Secondly, I want the mystery man to come forward. That person who had interaction with Jane Rimmer outside the Continental Hotel behind After us. After her friends had okay. left in the taxi, she stays behind at that hotel. That's correct. And the mystery man appears. That's right. You don't know where he went, who he was, how he left the scene, but you want him to come forward. That's exactly right. And lastly, we want to identify whoever was in that vehicle that spoke to Kira Glennon on Stirling Highway. We want that person or persons to come forward. And anybody who's been watching this program tonight who has information, no matter how small it might be, how insignificant they might think it might be, that can assist this inquiry, get in touch with you. Ring Crime Stoppers, give you the information. Yes because it could provide that one piece of the puzzle that you've been looking for for 12 years. Absolutely. One of the first tasks of the Claremont investigation was to try to establish what type of person could have picked up Sarah and Jane. While it's possible they were forced into a vehicle, police suspect it's more likely they went willingly with someone they knew, or at least felt they could trust. Detectives conduct hundreds of interviews with all the girl's known friends, associates and workmates. Uh, we had registers of people where they were in the evenings of, uh, in Claremont and interviewed thousands of people in relation to these things. And they said, OK, who, do you know, who else do you know was in Claremont that night? And I said, oh yeah, well it's Bill Smith and Mary Jones. And the police actually went and plotted and spoke to basically every person who was in Claremont, they actually had a big chart drawn up and plotted where people were at the time that Kira disappeared. So I think it was, must have taken an enormous amount of police work. Hoping to catch the killer, Macro conducted saturation undercover surveillance of the general Claremont area. They also used the police air wing and installed covert surveillance cameras on the streets. This resulted in the identification of men who followed women along the street and a number of rogue taxi drivers. Along with scores of other persons of interest, they are thoroughly investigated and all but a few are eliminated. Among those still being examined are two men who can provide no alibis for the times the three victims went missing. One was a known sexual pervert who had a semi-automatic rifle and ammunition concealed under the front seat of his car. Kira's body is believed to have been abandoned in bushland on the night she was killed. And this man knew the area so well, he could easily find his way along its bush tracks at night. Another of those still being investigated is a well-educated martial arts practitioner from a wealthy English family who worked closely with Sarah Spears and had once met Jane Rimmer. He was 34 at the time of the murders and lived alone not far from Claremont. During his police interviews, he told a series of blatant lies, playing down his close working relationship with Sarah and giving false alibis for the times Jane and Kira went missing. His polygraph test results have proved inconclusive. As yet, there is insufficient evidence to link either of these men or the other persons of interest to the murders. The spotlight is also turned on the taxi industry. 
Taxi drivers had been involved in a number of previous attacks on women in the Perth area. And at this time, there's also a flourishing illegal taxi industry. The rogue drivers, who are not officially vetted or registered in any way, simply put a sign on their car and it becomes a taxi. The order goes out to shut down the fake operators as police begin interviewing some of the three and a half thousand drivers of Perth's 1,200 taxis. So we coordinated with the taxi, with the taxi board and a number of other agencies that we would, um, we would uh, open the motor vehicle licensing centres on a particular weekend and ask the taxi drivers to drive their vehicles down and present themselves. It allowed us to eliminate uh, 1,800 taxi drivers, obtain DNA swabs from them, and also to forensically examine over 800 taxi vehicles. One constant fear is not only that the killer will strike again, but that he may have already done so. The cases of other young women, either missing or murdered in Perth and around Australia, are always under review but none have yet to be conclusively linked to the Claremont murders. We must realise that three girls were taken from the streets, that a person did those acts, and that it's quite possible that people know of that person or have heard or discussed things with them. In addition to that, if, if uh, persons are listening to this television program and they hear the investigators and they can assist, I should also bear in mind that there's still a reward outstanding for this matter of some 250000 for information leading to the identification of the person or persons responsible. So put that please in the back of your head, the persons who have knowledge of these matters. Um, we are there and we can offer confidentiality from, for information that comes to us. So if uh, the person who has information out there has concerns, please remember that we can help and are prepared to help. Over 12 years, police have gradually ruled out hundreds of leads and thousands of items of evidence. The investigation, of course, continues, and it's possible new information might provide a crucial breakthrough and solve the mystery of Sarah Spears' disappearance and the murders of Jane Rimmer and Kira Glennon. On the next episode of Crime Investigation Australia, the murder of a loving mother and her two children. Now their killer wants to be set free. John Ernest Cribb, The Devil Inside, next month on Crime Investigation Australia.